So um, I'm going to begin by giving a brief uh, introduction to X-ray crystallography. It's going to be very non-mathematical. We could spend a year talking about the physics of X-ray diffraction, uh, but we're not going to, uh, obviously, for time constraints. What I'm showing you here is uh, something everyone is really quite familiar and comfortable with, I think, and that's uh, my version of a light microscope. I've stripped away uh, almost all of the supporting structure. Uh, so let's take a look at, at kind of the essential elements of a light microscope here. It'll help you to understand X-ray crystallography, I believe. So if we have a little amoeba right here uh, on a stage that you can't see, we can illuminate it with visible light. And that visible light is scattered by the amoeba and goes off in multiple uh, directions, uh, different two theta angles, if you know something about diffraction. And then we have a lens above that that's been crafted to refract the scattered light, collect them, and add those waves back together so that they all come back together at a focal point here. And that would be a nice example of a magnification, a magnifying glass, but if we allow those uh, rays to uh, spread through, we can actually uh, go through another magnification step with a, se a second lens. And here we can actually um, add those waves together or focus them on our retina. And so the net result is that we see an enlarged image of our original object, this large enlarged um, 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 amoeba down here. So, so that's our light microscope and that's how that works. Um, and so I want to, at the beginning, address two questions in X-ray crystallography. Why X-rays and why crystals? Uh, getting back to why X-rays, there are physical limits on light microscopy, and this includes a factor of uh, lambda over two, where lambda is the wavelength of the light. And so we're limited essentially, say for light of a 400 nanometer wavelength, we're limited to about 200 nanometers resolution. We can't see anything smaller than that because uh, things that are less than uh, 200 nanometers in size will not interact with light that is uh, visible. So if you want to see objects or atoms that have dimensions in angstroms, then you need a different kind of light. You need a light that has a wavelength of two angstroms or less. And so we can ask the question, what type of electromagnetic radiation has a wavelength of an angstrom? And the answer is x-rays and neutrons, okay? All right, now here's a slide I stole from Julie's first lecture. She wants to talk about neutron and x-ray scattering here, and you can see some scattering of neutrons and diffraction and x-rays, but I couldn't help but notice that down here at the bottom, there are actually some electrons sneaking in, and for self-serving reasons, but some that I hope you'll find interesting later on, I'll note that an electron that's been accelerated at a voltage of 2, uh, 200,000 volts has a wavelength of about 0.06 angstroms. And so that's a short enough wavelength that we can also image atoms with um, electrons and electron diffraction as well. So the answer really is neutrons, x-rays, and electrons can all allow us to see things at an atomic scale. So what about crystals? Why crystals? And this is something that I think is intuitive to most of you. Um, x-rays can destroy biological uh, molecules. Uh, for that reason, we really try to limit the number of x-rays uh, that are impinging on our body. Uh, we don't go and get x-rays uh, anytime we need them, we really stop and think about the need for them. And if you put a single molecule on the stage of a microscope and you hit it with enough x-rays that you can get a bright image of it, the number of x-rays needed is actually far greater than the number of x-rays that uh, will destroy the object. So you're in a catch-22 here. You can't hit it with enough x-rays to see it without first destroying it. So what do you do? And the answer is you get a billion molecules that are somehow arranged in exactly the same orientation. And then they scatter together collectively, they reinforce. And so we can measure the scattering from that molecule or that uh, set of molecules a billion times faster. 
that's good if you're a graduate student or anyone doing x-ray diffraction. It means that you can actually collect your data a billion times faster, and you can also collect it with a billion times less radiation damage because it's spread over the entire population. And so we can actually collect diffraction data uh, in real time. So that's why we use crystals. So at this point, maybe I've convinced you that an X-ray microscope would re, uh, really be a very useful thing to have. So let's see if we can build one. So here's our light microscope. Let's uh, begin and with that and, and just start changing things. The first thing we want to do is change our visible light source to an X-ray light source. And now we can have X-rays that are shining on whatever object that we want to see at atomic resolution. And that object will scatter those X-rays. And the next thing we need here is a lens, OK? But a normal glass lens will not refract X-rays. In fact, there are no lenses for X-rays. So we have a problem here. How do we actually collect the waves that are scattered and add them back together at this point or this point? And the answer is that we're going to put a piece of film here. Boing. All right. And we're going to collect an image of these scattered x-rays. And then we can see the amplitudes of the different scattered x-rays. And then we can use a computer to add those scattered x-rays back together. So this is our x-ray microscope here, an x-ray source, a crystal with a billion molecules in it, scatter all the x-rays, we put a piece of film here or some other kind of modern detector to measure the position and the intensity of each of these scattered waves. And then we can use the, um, we can somehow uh, make a, a list of all the intensities of the scattered waves and we can use a computer to add those back together to get an, an enlarged image of our original object, all right? Each of these scattered waves has both an amplitude, which I'll call F, and a relative phase, alpha. So this wave here has a particular F and alpha, and this wave here has a particular F and alpha. And when these waves hit the film or the detector, we do actually capture the amplitude or the F. But the relative phases, the phase of this wave relative to the phase of this wave, that information is lost. So our phases, our alphas are lost. And that's the, the central uh, theoretical problem in X-ray crystallography is before we can add these waves back together to get this enlarged image of the original object, we actually have to first recover these missing phases. So the crystallographer is involved in this process as well, okay? But once we do recover these phases, then we can use what's called a Fourier synthesis to add these waves back together to get this enlarged image. And so what do we see when we do that? Do we see the nuclei of the atoms? And the answer is no, because the nuclei are still far smaller than the wavelength of the X-ray light that we're using. But what we do see are the electron clouds, okay? And we can draw borders between areas of low electron density and high electron density. And these borders we can also call contour lines. And so we can contour our map and we can see where the peaks are. And we understand that then as chemists that that's where the atoms are. And we can use our knowledge of bond lengths and bond angles to then build structural models. And that's shown here above this. And that is then our interpretation or the model that we build from the X-ray crystallography, okay? So here's another thing to consider. If we do put a piece of film here and capture uh, the scattering from an object, what does that look like? What do we see if we capture the scattered light on a film? And in the vernacular of X-ray crystallography, we see the transform of the object because the math that describes this is the Fourier transform. Here's an example of a transform of an object. We'll put a duck on the uh, microscope stage and we'll capture its transform here. And that transform is what we call reciprocal space. 
because it's one over distance versus distance over here. The high resolution parts of the scattering are out at the edges and the low uh, resolution parts are in the middle. So this is our transform of a duck. And one of the points I wanna make here is it's very difficult to look at the transform of an object and have any clue what it actually looks like, okay? All right, what if we have a crystal of ducks, an array of ducks? So here's a 2D crystal of ducks. When you have scattering from this duck and scattering from this duck and scattering from this duck all at the same time, sometimes the scattering comes together and reinforces, but in other parts of the transform, it actually is uh, combining um, in a destructive manner and canceling out. So what we see is we see the transform of the duck at certain places. It looks very much like the transform here. You can see dark stuff in the middle. There's kind of a cloud here and a cloud down here um, and a cloud out here. They're also present here, okay? But in certain places, we no longer see the transform because of the destructive interference but we still see the transform in enough places that we can determine a very high resolution structure of the ducts, okay? Um, so in crystallography, we talk about a convolution theorem. The diffraction pattern is really the convolution, or you can think of it as a product of the transform of the object, i.e. a duct, with the transform of the lattice. And here we have ducts on a lattice, and this gives us our um, transform or our diffraction pattern. And so if we go to a synchrotron or we collect uh, diffraction data off a crystal, it looks something like this. So here's a crystal at a synchrotron beam line. The x-rays are running perpendicular to your screen. Imagine they're coming out of your eye and hitting this red spot right here. And as I spin the crystal, you'll see the diffraction patterns that are showing up from it. This is a shadow here from the beam stop so that the beam, the direct beam that's going into the crystal and the detector is back behind here so that that direct beam doesn't hit the crystal. And this is roughly about how long it takes to collect a diffraction data set, a 3D diffraction data set at a synchrotron these days. If we do this at a home source, it'll take significantly longer. It might take a day. But we oftentimes collect data at, on our X-ray diffractometer here at Montana State because that we can do that whenever we want to. We don't have to wait, say, six weeks or two or three months for synchrotron time. And so oftentimes it can be faster uh, in terms of getting a structure to actually collect data here. At least we collect preliminary data here and make sure that the crystals that we're sending to the synchrotron are, are ready for that work. Okay, so here's a 2D uh, image. And once we have this diffraction data, what do we have to do? Well, every uh, peak on here actually has indices that effectively give it a name. And those are on a grid system. Uh, and we talk about indices H, K, and L. So um, the, where is the, the origin of our diffraction pattern is right at this spot right here. Its indices are zero, 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 right here, okay? And so we can say, all right, what is the intensity of that point? And I'll just arbitrarily say it's 100, okay? I look at it with my eye, which is a very uh, sophisticated scanning densitometer, and it tells me that there's an intensity of 100 there. So now what is the intensity of the zero, one, zero reflection? Well, first of all, we have to find it. Where is it? So we go zero along X, which means we don't go anywhere. We go up one at Y and there's no Z dimension here. So this reflection right here is the O101 reflection. It looks a little less intense than the OOO reflection. And so it probably has an intensity of about 75. What about the O2O? That'll be this little light guy right here. And its intensity is obviously 13. 
And we can do this for the 030, the 040, the 011, the 012, the 013, until we get down to the 720. Where's the 720? We'll go 7 and X, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And now up 2, 1, 2. That's this guy right here. Oh, his intensity is 21. And the 730 is this guy right here. He's pretty strong. He's about 80. This guy's a little weaker. He's 68. And this guy here is only about 44. And so we can go through with either software or a scanning densitometer to assign indices HKL and measure the intensities of all these. But again, we don't know the phases for these. Now that we have measured the intensities for these, and assuming we get the phases alpha from someplace, we can do a summation over all the indices HKL and add all the waves together at any point X, Y, Z to determine the electron density at that point X, Y, Z. All right, so rho represents the value of the electron density at a point X, Y, Z. And so that's how we construct our electron density maps. I'd like to do a virtual experiment here for you real fast. We've talked about both intensities and phases. The phases are what we lost, the intensities are what we capture. We'll talk about how we recover these phases in a minute, although it's really beyond this talk. But what's more important, the intensities or the phases? So here's our duck, we've seen that, and here's the transform of the duck. This time the transform of the duck is in color because we have colored it by the value of the phase at each point. So red might be phases somewhere between zero and 90 degrees, and then the yellows and greens between 90 and 180, and the blues between uh, 180 and 270, and the purples are back uh, 270 to 360, et cetera, okay? So here's our duck, our duck transform with phase information. Here's our, another pet for us, a cat. Here's the transform of a cat. It looks different than the transform of a duck but you certainly couldn't tell um, which was which if you didn't know. And now we're gonna do an interesting combination here. We're gonna take the duck intensities and the cat phases. So we're gonna take the cat colors, but the duck intensities and put them together. So you can see that the cat colors, kind of this uh, chicane shaped red here is present here, whereas the duck is just a central spot. But you can see that that central intensity right here is more intense than on the edges because it's really from this intensity here, okay? And now we can take the back transform of this and we get this image here. You can see, first off, there's a lot of noise in it. But if you look at the center, you can say, okay, do I see an animal there? And if so, does it look more like a cat or more like a duck? And at least to me, this looks more like the cat. And so what's more important, the intensities or the phases? Well, here we see a cat and we use the cat phases and the duck intensities. And so that shows you that the, actually the having accurate in, uh, phases is more important uh, to this process than having um, accurate intensities. Um, and unfortunately, it's the phase information that we've lost, okay? So uh, <clears throat> that's kind of a nice virtual experiment to show you uh, the importance uh, of both the phases and the intensities. And it's the phase information that we've lost. So how do we solve the phase problem? If you're doing small molecule crystallography, we use what are called direct methods. And basically, um, you just throw your intensities uh, into a computer program it uses trial and error to assign phases, and it has a way of seeing whether or not you're making any progress. And once you get the correct phases assigned to some small number of reflections, there's a way then to use um, uh, triplet information between phases in sets of three reflections to deduce what the phases of the remaining reflections must be. And you don't really have to know much about that to use that. Uh, and most people that are doing a uh, small molecule crystallography uh, don't really think about how those direct methods are actually working on a regular basis. In um, macromolecular crystallography, we have too many reflections to solve that using direct methods. And also they usually don't go to high enough resolution. 
And so we have three ways of solving the uh, phase problem for macromolecular crystallography. Most often these days it's by molecular replacement. We'll use a structure of a similar um, protein or a uh, piece of DNA or RNA or complex as a starting model and then we'll refine from there. But uh, before we knew structures of so many proteins, we had to do what was called de novo structure determination. And the original de novo structure determinations, say for myoglobin, hemoglobin, were done by multiple isomorphous replacement. That was uh, a technique invented by Max Perutz. And then later on, we began to have synchrotron radiation and we used multi-wavelength anomalous diffraction where each wavelength is almost equivalent to a different isomorphous or heavy atom replacement. And this was really uh, pioneered by uh, Wayne Hendricks and colleagues, whereas molecular replacement was by Michael Rossman, okay? So if you actually wanna solve a structure, what do you need? Um, or maybe you wanna solve a structure uh, working with me. What do you need uh, if you're gonna work with me? And the answer is you really need to be able to uh, purify about three milligrams of protein, at least to get started. That protein needs to be pure by SDS page. Uh, the purer, the better. The protein has to be stable because it's gonna take a week or more for it to crystallize and it's gonna be sitting around at 18 degrees C. Uh, and so you don't want it to be uh, precipitating out or being chewed up by proteases. Um, so it needs to be stable. And it also needs to be free of nonspecific aggregation. And the way we test for that usually is by actually putting it over a suitable size exclusion column and making sure that it's a well-defined peak that's not in the void volume. If you can do that, and that's mostly just good old fashioned careful biochemistry and concentrate that then to about 10 mg per mil, it's ready for a crystallization screen. And we have a crystallization robot here on campus that can oftentimes find initial crystallization conditions um, very quickly. Um, and then after that, you can spend a few weeks or months optimizing those. How long does the whole process take? Um, it'll take weeks to months to optimize crystallization, depending upon how your protein cooperates. Um, it just takes a while. You have to uh, you know, put drops together and then wait a week sometimes to read them and iterate so you can be doing other things while you're doing this. Uh, once you have the crystals, uh, you're ready to go though. If it's a typical molecular replacement structure, you might complete the whole project in three to six months. Or if it's a de novo structure determination, that might be half a year to 18 months. Some of the time that's built into this here is because there's a learning curve if you've not done this before. If you're an expert in it already, it could move much faster. I'm gonna mention that there's other ways though to determine structures of proteins at atomic resolution. Uh, and you can do those even without crystallizing them. So um, a transmission electron microscopy uh, under cryogenic conditions now uses a technique, a technique known as single particle analysis. And the resolution there is usually less than crystallography, but uh, the resolution is, is moving along very quickly there. Um, this is an example uh, from a microscope at the Scripps Research Institute called the Talos Artica. It's a 200 kilovolt um, uh, transmission electron microscope. And with this apoferritin, uh, they're able to get a 1.6 angstrom structure. And you can see uh, beautiful electron density for the uh, structure in this. I mentioned and used this particular example because this Talo Arctica, we now have one here at Montana State University here as well. It's essentially a microscope in a box and um, you actually drive or control the microscope from outside the room. So this is a graduate student here getting ready to put samples in. Uh, we're still installing this, but this is the high tension take. We have a bunch of um, electronics back here. This is about a $3.8 million project. Um, and um, we had first light uh, a couple weeks ago. We hope to be up and running later this summer. Um, this microscope will allow single particle analysis like I just showed you. It'll also do cryogenic electron tomography, uh, which allows you to come up with nanometer structures for cellular 
um, components, uh, gives you a 3D structure uh, at much higher resolution than um, confocal microscopy, but it does give you a Z-stack like a confocal experiment. You can go through that Z-stack and look at three-dimensional in in um, information. And it also does a new technique that's coming on board called microelectron diffraction that I wanted to talk about briefly. Okay, so microelectron diffraction or micro ED will uh, collect diffraction data from 3D crystals in a microscope. Uh, if we um, look at the capabilities of this Tallow Artica, when we accelerate electrons there, it's almost like a free electron, a laser that allows diffraction from very small, less than micron sized crystals within the microscope. And this is uh, again, a technique known as micro ED. Um, these micron sized crystals of proteins are often much easier to grow than the larger crystals need for X-ray crystallography. And one reason that this works so well is electrons interact with uh, biological materials much more strongly than x-rays. And so the uh, scattering off the small crystals is much stronger uh, with electrons than it is for x-rays. So here's just a, a manufacturer's <laughs> video that shows you how this works. The solution is placed on the same kind of grid used in many cryo-EM applications. This solution is filled with numerous tiny nanocrystals, which are about one billionth of the size of those needed for x-ray crystallography. The droplet is then flash frozen using liquid ethane at negative 180 degrees Celsius. After freezing, the grid is transferred into a cryotem. The transfer process is also conducted under cryogenic condition to ensure sample integrity. These experiments are conducted in diffraction mode. Each nanocrystal can be observed individually. The data is collected as video on a fast camera, while the frozen crystal is continuously rotated. The end result? is a video composed of many discrete frames, and each frame contains hundreds of diffraction peaks. It is these peaks that will reveal information about the underlying structure of the sample. Data processing software easily identifies separate diffraction peaks. You can clearly see that each peak in this 3D representation has a different intensity. These peak intensities contain information about the structure of the sample. This process is repeated for all frames in the videos, and the data is combined by scaling and merging. As the crystals are oriented randomly on the grid, a complete 3D reciprocal representation can be obtained. The 3D reciprocal information is then resolved into the protein structure using X-ray refinement programs. In this case, the structure of proteinase K has been resolved with a resolution of two angstroms. So if you were listening carefully towards the end there, you heard that essentially we use the same programs that we use for X-ray crystallography to deal with integrating the, re, the uh, diffraction data uh, for doing the molecular replacement or multiple isomorphous replacement or uh, MAD, and then for building and refining the models. So the only thing we're doing here is substituting electron diffraction with very small crystals uh, for the X-ray diffraction on larger crystals at a synchrotron. To begin. So let's go on now to what can we do with these techniques? And if I were giving you a complete biological talk, I might be talking about biological warfare in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, this is the Crater Hills geyser in Yellowstone National Park. And uh, inside these extremely hot pools, there are, as I'm sure you guys know, are keel. Archaea and uh, archaeal or, uh, viruses, and those viruses actually can infect the archaea. And one thing we've done with X-ray crystallography and single particle analysis to determine a structure of several viruses uh, uh, at atomic resolution and make 3D atomic structures of complete viruses. This virus here is called STIV, and it's about 60 million grams per mole molecular weight, 60 megadol. Okay, so we have an atomic model for that virus, and we did that in large part with X-ray crystallography uh, and single particle analysis. That work was done by these people here, and it's been a while since we did that, 
Um, but that's one example of, of how uh, crystallography can solve interesting biological problems. We're going beyond that these days. We're using um, a cry cryogenic electron microscopy to actually look at how viruses interact with whole cells. This is uh, a, the viral host, Sulfolobus sulfatericus, and we see that it actually attaches to filaments coming off of those guys. And using uh, cryo-electron tomography, we're actually able to get um, about two nanometer resolution uh, structures for the interaction, these 3D structures for interactions with these filaments. And then we can fit our atomic model in for the virus into that cryo-EM data, and we can get pseudo-atomic models now from cellular um, um, structures and see how uh, conserved residues are involved in interacting with those filaments. And now we know how the virus attaches to uh, initially to its host, uh, and we have a nice atomic model for that, okay? And so you can see we're interested here in virus-host interactions for quite some time. And this interest in virus-host interactions also led to a, a very early interest on our part on structure function studies for CRISPR-Cas. Now, I think that most of you have heard of CRISPR-Cas before. Uh, it's gained tremendous attention uh, because it's been adapted for use as a gene editing tool. But that's not why nature invented it. Nature invented, invented CRISPR-Cas as a prokaryotic adaptive immune system that's found in about 40% of bacteria and 90% of archaea, okay? How does CRISPR-Cas adaptive immunity work? Well, it has three stages, an adaptation stage shown up here in the top part, a CRISPR RNA maturation stage shown here in the middle part of this diagram, and stage three is surveillance and interference down here, okay? So let's take a look at adaptation. In adaptation, there inside the cell uh, is the DNA genome, and within that DNA genome, there are segments that uh, have what's called a CRISPR array. They are uh, repeats shown in black here, 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 and here. And it was first these repeats that picked up people's interest. And in between the repeats are spacers shown here as these red, yellow, blue diamonds. And this is a CRISPR spacer array. CRISPR stands for clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. The repeats are the black part, okay? And on top of that, there are these CRISPR-associated genes or Cas genes. And these Cas genes encode proteins that are called Cas proteins. And here are two of them, Cas1 in blue and Cas2 in green. And if a virus infects a cell, and injects its DNA into it, Cas1 and Cas2 can recognize that foreign DNA under certain circumstances, and they can cut out a little piece of that foreign DNA as a protospacer, and then they can insert it into the DNA genome. And that's the step that we call adaptation, taking a small piece of uh, DNA from an invading virus and inserting it into the host genome. Then in stage two, CRISPR RNA maturation, that CRISPR RNA is transcribed to make pre-CRISPR RNA. The repeats have palindromes in them, so they form these kind of hairpins. And then a, a third Cas protein called Cas6 will hop on to the repeats and cleave them up so that you wind up with small pieces of what we call CRISPR RNA. They'll be the spacer, in this case, a blue spacer with a bit of repeat left, or a red spacer with a bit of repeat left. And these are now the mature CRISPR RNAs. These Cas genes also make these Cas proteins. And in step three, um, these uh, CRISPR RNAs and Cas proteins assemble into a surveillance or interference complex, and they carry the CRISPR RNA with them. If a second virus comes along and injects its DNA, and it's the same virus that was uh, doing this up here, then it has this little piece of red DNA here, 
And the complex looks for complementarity between the CRISPR RNA and the viral DNA. And if they get base pairing between this, there are conformational changes that then activate nuclease activity in the surveillance complex. The surveillance complex says, ha, huh, I found a match to that viral DNA. It must be a virus. I'm going to activate my nuclease. I'm going to destroy that DNA. And now we've cured the cell of the viral infection. So this is a beautiful adaptive immune system. And if humans were as nimble as Sulfalobus sulfatericus, we could simply insert a small piece of SARS coronavirus 2 into our CRISPR arrays, transcribe it, and then we would have um, immunity to COVID and our COVID-19 pandemic would be over, at least if we could kill all the virus before it mutates, okay? So this is really a very clever system that these uh, prokaryotes have, all right. Um, it turns out that there are three main or different types of CRISPR-Cas systems called types one, types two, and type three. In our Sulfalobus sulfatericus sulfa cell out of Yellowstone, we have type one and type three systems and they're very complementary to each other. Type one requires, well, it, first of all, it targets DNA and it requires a PAM, a protospacer adjacent motif. So basically, it has this little PAM sequence that is next to the protospacer. And, and that PAM has to be there. And the reason why is because if it weren't, then and instead of attacking the, the uh, virus, it could also attack the protospacer in its own DNA. And that would be a problem, a self-recognition uh, self problem, an autoimmune response. And so it, it needs that PAM there. Okay, type three systems though don't target DNA, they target RNA and they don't require a PAM. The problem with the type three systems though is that if it's a DNA virus and you're only killing RNA, you can slow down the infection but you can't actually cure the cell of that infection. And so Sulfalobus sulfatericus has both types. It has a type one complex and a type three complex. If our virus mutates and is missing the PAM, then this type one complex can't recognize it anymore. But if the viral DNA is transcribed by an RNA polymerase to give this RNA here, then the type three complexes with their CRISPR RNA can still find complementarity and they can basically destroy that newly transcribed RNA so that RNA I'm sorry, so that viral proteins aren't being made. So that's an essential step in viral replication. And as long as this is doing it, it's at least keeping the virus from replicating. When it finds a match to viral RNA, this Cas10 protein here in purple does a nice trick. It takes four ATP molecules and makes a, a small four-base cyclic RNA called cyclic tetraadenylate or CA4. This CA4 is a second messenger uh, or a signal that is recognized by other Cas proteins that have what we call a CARF domain in it. And one of those CARF domain proteins is called CSA3. And it turns out that CSA3 is a transcription factor. The transcription factor CSA3, when it's activated by the CA4 signal, will then actually bind in front of the CRISPR array and in front of the Cas genes and call, cause Cas1 and Cas2 to be transcribed and make the Cas1-2 protein complex that will then go out and get new spacers and insert those new spacers into a CRISPR array. And they'll be next to a PAM sequence. The, the CSA3 will also cause, cause transcription of the new CRISPR array so that the new spacer that's in here gets put into a new type one complex. And now this new type one complex can then um, search the cell, find the viral DNA that it couldn't find earlier because there was a mutated PAM sequence, but now it's got a new spacer and it can destroy that DNA. So this is an important 
a piece of crosstalk between the type three and the type one systems. Type three says, uh, danger, danger, we found invading viral RNA and the type one complex isn't working. So we better uh, turn on transcription of the uh, cache genes that get new spacers so that we can get a new spacer and we'll turn on transcription of the CRISPR array so we can make new CRISPR RNAs, load those into new type one complexes and now uh, cure our infection. So how does this happen at the molecular level? How does um, CA4 actually cause this change? And so we've done a lot of work in this area. We can determine the structure of CSA3. Here are crystals of CSA3. Here's a beautiful diffraction pattern. Here's the polypeptide structure that we uh, solved for this. This was done by a graduate student in my lab, Nathaniel Lintner, back in 2011. Um, and we actually know that this uh, single protein makes a dimer to make this transcription factor. We did some small angle X-ray scattering. And now more recently, Alex Charbonneau has actually crystallized CSA3 with the CA4 uh, signal here. And so here it is with the CA4 bound here, and it causes conformational changes in these uh, domains up here. These are called winged helix turn helix domains. Uh, these are the carp domains down here. You don't, don't really see that conformational change though when you just look at a static structure very well. If we flip this 90 degrees though, and look uh, into the bottom of this pocket, we see how the CA4 actually binds, but I'm gonna actually show you a movie in a minute. And now one of the things that we do see is that there are conformational changes that allow us to dock the DNA uh, to the DNA reading heads up above, okay? And so now it's capable of binding to DNA. Here's a movie where I can show you, this is the structure of the protein uh, by Lintner et al. in 2011 without CA4 bound. Here's CA4 down here, and we're gonna let CA4 dock into the CA4 binding pocket, and you'll see the conformational changes that happen when CA4 binds there. So here comes the CA4, and it's causing conformational changes the changes are originally happening down here, but they're transmitted all the way up here. There's a rotation of these domains. If we zoom up on here, here's the cyclic tetradenylate. Here's adenine, 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 adenine. Here's the ribose phosphate backbone. It's in, and here is a phenylalanine that covers over this adenine ring. We're gonna go back in one more time. Okay, and now we'll go and I'll show you, oops, a second movie. So uh, now here is our DNA up here. Here's CA4 down here. This is the structure without CA4 bound. The CA4 comes up, there's a conformational change. Now from this angle, you can see the movement of these DNA binding heads much more clearly. And as these reading heads they're gonna come in towards the DNA and towards each other. So that's kind of get, going to let them have a pinching motion that pinches down on the DNA as the CA4 moves in. Open, closed onto the DNA, open. Closed onto the DNA. So X-ray crystallography of these two different structures, one with CA4 and one without CA4, actually helps us understand the dynamics that are involved and the conformational changes that are introduced when the signaling molecule binds uh, and then causes conformational changes that then allow it to bind onto um, the, the target DNA. Okay, so here's our structure of CSA3 with its um, bound target DNA. And basically CSA3, once CA4 comes in, then goes and it binds in front of the CRISPR array and it will recruit an RNA polymerase. And that RNA polymerase will then 
cause transcription of the CRISPR array. And the CSA3 also binds at a site here in front of Cas1 and Cas2 and causes those to be transcribed. That gets translated and makes this. So that's our kind of molecular level understanding now about how CA4 causes uh, transcription of the CRISPR array and the Cas genes. So that's my story in a nutshell for today. I'll stop there, but we've done lots of structural work on viruses and virus host interactions in archaea, and we have lots of other things. We're basically interested in any kind of structural studies. And so if you're interested in crystallography uh, or some of these other techniques that I mentioned today, please uh, feel free to give me a, a, a shout. Give me a